Welcome to Inside Scoop with Sean Emery. Every week we are examining something new, bringing you closer to companies, sectors, and themes. This recording should not be construed as a substitute for personalized individual advice from Avery and Company or any guests on the show. This is for educational purposes only and not intended to make an offer or solicitation for any companies or securities mentioned. With that, let's get on with the episode. All right, we're here with Ethan Chernovsky, the man with the data at Placer AI. We've had Ethan on numerous times here on Inside Scoop, uh, really to share with us his views on trends going on in foot traffic data. I know you guys raised a, a ton of money last time we spoke, uh, Ethan. So first off, welcome back. How are you doing? How's everything at Placer, yourself, everything? I mean, yeah, like no, no, no complaints. Things are going good. We're continuing to kind of grow, keep focused on, on providing value to our customers and uh, taking this thing forward. Cool. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think... Going back into the archives, you know, we spoke on uh, right around uh, kind of just after COVID. Uh, we spoke wow, originally. Man. We were tracking movements to see if people were moving again. Um, <laughs> I think that was like uh, state number one. And then, you know, last time was really the plan out the year, which was around department stores seeing traffic trends increase relative mm-hmm. to kind of prior. You know, l- let's just fast forward to today and just um, understand the environment. I think literally the three times we spoke, each environment was completely different, trying to find out new information. We bring Ethan on here because, again, foot traffic kind of says it all in some ways. We, we track app store downloads as well and, and web traffic. But, you know, I think to, to complete the picture, uh, humans and individual kind of uh, transportation still exist. So what's happening in foot traffic that's top of mind with you? What are you seeing that uh, is notable? So I think there's, there's a few things that are really kind of striking a chord for us at the moment. And one of the big ones is potentially seeing this kind of recovery from the depths of what was the negative impacts driven by kind of these economic headwinds. So inflation, high gas prices, et cetera. And I think what we've seen almost since kind of mid-July is that if you look at visits, whether it's year over year, or year over three year, you're starting to see those visit gaps shrink. And that's super important because we're going to head into a really critical holiday season. So we know that the back to school season was impacted by a really tough comp to a really strong season in 21. Uh, we know it was impacted by high gas prices. We know it was impacted by inflation. And so this idea that we could have a consumer it is proving to be more resilient and especially heading into a holiday season where, especially in brick and mortar, the comp is going to be much, much better, right? Because 2021 was already starting to be impacted by, by Omicron. You had much more kind of stores that weren't operating at the same, the same capacity because of labor shortages. So there is this potential that at least in the physical environment, the holiday season could be really strong. And especially if we see kind of the consumer confidence starting to rise again as displayed in foot traffic, that could be a really powerful indicator heading into that season. Yeah, so, ah, so I'm bringing this up now, which is really around industry trends. And I think this just perfectly uh, highlights what you were just talking about, which is, you know, a recovery. I think everything is going up and to the right, which is a good thing. Is there anything I think that you can call out? Uh, I know you talked about maybe some of the categories specific to, um, uh, you know, back to school. But I think, again, you're seeing department stores, which you could argue is back to school as well. But there's other categories. And I've been reading some of the stuff that you've been posting, whether it's, you know, electronics, um, you know, restaurants, any categories or, or call outs by company that you think uh, really has seen that inflection or at least moderation in declines or acceleration in growth? Yeah, I mean, look, look at Best Buy. Best Buy is a top tier retailer, just super effective in their decision making in the types of innovation they roll out and the way they kind of stay ahead of the curve. And I think you think they were really negatively impacted by this economic environment. So if I'm trying to figure out how to make my dollar go a little bit farther, I don't necessarily need a new computer right now. So that hardcore discretionary spending is going to be impacted. But now that we see those recoveries, that gives you a lot of confidence. And these are generally retailers that are also heavily impacted by the holiday season in a positive way. And so again, you see that that recovery, that you know, growing consumer confidence, even amid it's still difficult environment, is a really positive side sign heading into the holiday season. Yeah, that makes sense. Um... It's it's interesting because we are hearing we're seeing that I guess in web traffic and we've heard that uh, there was a lot of uh, investor conferences for different companies whether it's like the Wixes and Fivers and some others um, some of the categories that benefited I guess call it post COVID that still held like pretty good um, uh, growth thereafter um, but it's also moderation I guess if you will uh, in that kind of like May June ish period um, and I think last week a lot of them were talking about stability and didn't necessarily want to hint that reacceleration but we're saying it in a way without saying it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the pace of that acceleration, we could all, uh, you know, whatever that is relative to the specific uh, company or industry. Um, but it does seem like, you know, we went through a lull and then kind of a realization that potentially, you know, let's move on and not say get back to normal, but um, uh, uh, just understand that, you know, there, there was this moment where gas prices were rising aggressively and nobody knew where, where that 
uh, would end. And then we saw, again, the other side of gas prices, at least for now. We'll see where that heads. Um, let's move on to another topic, which I think is uh, interesting that's happening in the physical world of kind of retail in general. And you have a nice piece on this, but we see it anecdotally just listening to earnings calls and, and just following different companies. The state of advertising in the in the physical world, um, yeah. you know, Walmart's talking a lot about it. Best Buy it has been doing it uh, in in small scale. Um, just talk about what you're seeing in digital advertising in these in these brick and mortar locations, and and kind of anything you're, you're you're seeing there. Yeah. So I think one of the a thesis that we've had for a while now is that the store is an underutilized asset. So we we generally, if you think the way we look at kind of e-commerce and online or digital kind of channels. You know, take social media. If we have a brand that has a social media following of 10 million on Instagram, we don't ask, well, how many dollars are you creating through that Instagram channel? We recognize that the reach in and of itself is a value. What we are increasingly needing to do with the physical space is apply that same lens. So for example, how many people walk into a store, spend five to 15 minutes in there, even if they never buy something that has a really significant impact. So we saw the CEO of Allbirds, you know, said publicly that they have 150% larger basket size for someone who visits a store and then shops online versus someone who just goes straight online as their first touch point. So there is this kind of impact that a store visit has. And one of those impacts is the, is the eyeballs it gets at the point of purchase, so or very close to the point of purchase. So imagine I want to reach a certain audience. I'm selling headphones. I want to reach someone when they need that headphone the most. My chance to kind of market my product in the same place I sell it is really powerful or think, you know, we have a food brand and we're selling some sort of healthy snack food. We want to hit people when they're most likely to buy a healthy snack food, which is in a supermarket or a convenience store. And the really interesting thing is there's all these different ways to segment audiences that we never really kind of used before, right? So it gives us this ability to kind of hyper-target. So for example, let's say <clears throat> I want to target markets that are, I want to target a, a budget-oriented shopper in a town that has less than 100,000 people. So I segment out all of the cities in the country that have less than 100,000 people. And I look for dollar, store, uh, dollar generals, uh, family dollars, et cetera, within those markets. That's a really interesting way to potentially segment an audience and say, these are the type of people I want to reach. And therefore, and this is the product I want to reach them with. And I want to use the store as the advertising mechanism. So whether it be kind of a digital signage, uh, some kind of experiential component, some store and store component, the ability to kind of say, the store gets all this traffic and all this value. And I can segment it in a really interesting way. Gives me a powerful capacity to look at physical locations for more than just sales, but as a way to reach my consumer. Even think about you know cross shopping. So I want to find these stores. I'm going to sell electronics within a Walmart. So I want to find the stores that are the most cross shopping with a Best Buy because I know that that is an electronics oriented shopper. So there's these cool ways of kind of breaking down audiences, hmm. plus the power and magnitude of reach that a store provides can give these brands a really unique ability to reach audiences really close to the point of purchase when they have this high sign of intent. And so it's something that we think could generate a lot of revenue and a lot of opportunities. So revenue for the retailers and then opportunities for these CPG companies to reach these audiences more effectively. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, we saw that digitally with Amazon, right? When, where they were just selling and then eventually now their ad business is a pretty large component of, of the revenue and profits that they're generating today. And it makes even more sense when you're talking about the, the type of traffic. It, it sounds like the scaled players really are at advantage there. Mm -hmm. um, which further entrenches the, you know, the leaders in this space, whether it's again, I mean, Walmart, I think has probably the most traffic who, who else on that list is, is probably well positioned. Target is, is obviously very well positioned. Home Depot, Lowe's, Dollar General, you know, big lots, five below all of them. And but the truth is, you know, you're right in the sense that, a, you know, even a, a chain, so to speak, with only three or four locations doesn't have that same value to bring. But even if I'm a regional chain, that's a tremendous amount of value. So think, you know, think South Florida, if I want to reach certain audiences and I can look at Publix and then I can segment out the Publix based on a whole variety of different factors to ask, where do I want to position certain products? Where do I want to reach certain audiences? That same approach that would take me to kind of customize my, my product mix by store, I can also customize the way I reach my audiences by store. And as the retailers get more sophisticated, they're going to enable a lot of revenue and opportunities. And it's going to give CPG companies a really unique ability to reach audiences in a different way. So it's not signing a deal with you know a, a large region it's asking hey where do i put this product so that the right products are brought to the right stores to reach the right audiences that, yeah that makes a lot of sense um yeah i guess you could build an ad network around this that's not necessarily uh vertical right like if walmart's building their own that's good for walmart but you know there's like the the large-scale publishers that exist in like the digital world and then there's the small ones where you know you have google as kind of like your 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 targeting um uh, adsense inside of all your websites so you don't even have to be scaled to actually have that. That's interesting. Um, cool. On the next kind of topic that I definitely wanted to bring up with you is really around, you know, the 
ability, and you talked about it a second ago, was kind of using this digital presence that you have, um, using that kind of influence and, and driving physical demand. Um, talk about, I mean, you really just spoke uh, about um, uh, the burger chain um, and around that influencer that built that out. Um, just talk about that experience, the data that you accumulated and, and what your kind of high level takeaway is. Yeah, so I, we got a message saying, hey, I, it was basically a, a link and I believe it was in, in CNBC though I might be misquoting it. Um, that talked about Mr. Beast launching his first kind of physical burger concept in the American Dream Mall in New Jersey. We're like, okay, this is interesting. Let's check it out. Right. And, you know, it's, it's the Sunday of Labor Day weekend. So you're expecting to see some sort of peak, but we saw it like blew our mind. Like you look at that Sunday, the 4th, and you consider, look at the period between September 1st, 21, all the way through September 8th, 2022. You take the average daily visits. This was 300 and more than 320% above that average. It was the best day the American Dream Mall has ever had. And it's not even close. And so it's obviously this is somewhat of an outlier. Like Mr. Beast sure. is potentially the biggest online influencer, huge reach, huge ability to kind of galvanize his audience. He's proven that multiple times. And so it's definitely something that's special, but it's not the only place we've seen this. So, you know, Kim Kardashian had her pop up at the South Coast Plaza Mall in, in California. And that drove massive impact for this pop up over several months. And so this powerful opportunity that influencers have to bring urgency and to bring excitement to a physical location is super significant. And the more we see brands, physical locations look to cross pollinate digital and physical and like really embrace omni-channel capabilities, you're going to see really powerful returns because it's not just the crazy thing for you know, the American dream mall, let alone Mr. Beast burger place. So imagine lots of people buy, lots of people buy burgers that day. Fantastic. But everyone else in that mall also benefits. And so his value becomes, and the value of that chain becomes more than just a tenant that's paying rent. It's an anchor, like it's something that's driving this ongoing draw. And I think you're going to see more physical locations, more malls, more shopping centers asking two really interesting questions. One, how do we keep an ongoing mix of things? How do we keep things fresh? How do we keep things exciting? And then two, how do we find these digital entities, whether they be brands, whether they be influencers, to kind of drive some of that Instagram obsession, that focus on TikTok and use it to leverage people into a physical place or a physical environment. And I think that's some, those are two trends that are clearly going to have a growing impact in brick and mortar retail. Right. No, that makes sense. And then I'm assuming you, if you look for hashtags of Mr. Beast, uh, there was quite a bit of photos of people taking uh, pictures there, which again, really uh, emphasizes the cycle of, you know, uh, call it free promotion for the mall, you know, because there's location-based data that's being supported there and where you're at and what location. Um, I mean, it's pretty fascinating. How do you think um, in, in terms of building out the future uh, malls, is there anything that I think in the planning process that can manifest from this, um, whether it's, you know, pop-up style like hubs um, that kind of are pre created for this type of behavior as opposed to, I, obviously he, he actually has a burger chain um, and he's really trying to roll these things out. Um, but more so for like the one-offs, uh, whether it's, you know, Kim Kardashian. Again, we're talking about the, the highest level of influencers out there, but still you can probably do this at subscale in a in, in any town, really. Yeah, no, I think you're, you're, you're dead on. I think when you look at top tier malls, there's a few cool things that are happening. And they all kind of lead to this place of greater differentiation, greater focus on excitement and experience in a more holistic sense. So, you know, we spoke to one mall owner who spoke openly about the fact that we're trying to, apparel was like what, 70% of their tenant mix, like Carol and Beauty. And they want to bring that down closer to 50%. Now, if they're bringing that down closer to 50%, what are they looking to fill that, that gap that was created? They want to focus on uh, fitness, uh, food and beverage. They want to focus on, on health tenants and people that kind of augment their gaps, but also create more interesting things around them. They want to have places set up for pop-ups. They want to have places set up for some of their brands to launch experiential components. So you want to have this, like these courtyards where you can do something really interesting and exciting. You want to have a certain degree of turnover so you can keep what's happening in the mall fresh and interesting. Mm. And so that shift in focus away from, hey, I need leases that last a really long time, as opposed to, you know what, if this one's a little bit shorter, that might actually be good for me. I just need to think differently about the space then so that I can keep things coming in, keep that level of, of excitement for the visitor. I think what's really interesting there is you have two potential impacts. One, malls that are more exciting on an ongoing basis for their audience. But two, potentially more diversity in malls. And we've been talking about this for, for, for literally like two or three years now. If I have more competition from apparel brands for less spaces set aside for apparel brands, there's going to be a push for those, those, those best in class malls in any region. But then those other retailers who don't succeed, they still need to bring their products. So whether it's a shift back to wholesale, 
or whether it's looking at you know, that B plus mall that like was just under that top tier, could this lead to those being reinvigorated? I think the answer is yes. And what's cool, so you see this kind of waterfall effect of strength and a de decline in, in the supply available for retailers to kind of put a location could have this trickle down effect where it actually creates more re interesting retail experiences across the board. And we go from this conversation where like defined by the fact that we are so grossly over mauled to one that is much more balanced and creates a lot more opportunity across the board. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because I was thinking about it when you talked about the 50% um, and it probably declining in a sense is, you know, if you are part of that 50%, you're probably uh, a pretty good company um, as opposed to kind of, you know, I, you walked into so many malls and the product's pretty uh, subpar um, and you're passing a bunch of subpar brands um, before you reach something that you really want. Um, that's interesting. You know, I don't know if you know, uh, I was in Austin the other day and uh, we, we, we saw a Target right next to Whole Foods. And we just noticed conceptually that there was a lot of Targets next to Whole Foods. Um, and it's really the joining of uh, two brands uh, that potentially don't overlap as much um, in terms of their core product. Um, do you know any of the planning process behind that? I'm assuming my wife will be happy with the answer if, uh, if you got one. <laughs> it was her question. Think, every brand is different, right? And it's very difficult to tell who's, who's kind of the one who's looking for whom. But there is this concept of like co-tenancy, right? So what, who do I want to be around? There's, whether it's the right kind of audience that's nearby that they bring in that could also shop at my store, whether it's complimentary. You have like, there's more traditional conceptions of what a good co-tenant is. And then there's more database ones, which can be very kind of counterintuitive especially for those who've been in the real estate market for a long time and have a certain perspective on things. True. But yeah, there are a lot of retailers who will look at a market and say, I want, if, if there is an X here, I want to be nearby. If there is a Y and an X, oh my God, that's the dream scenario. But if there's a Z, get me the hell away from this. this, this right. Set. And it, it's, it's a lot about understanding who's bringing me a complimentary audience, who's bringing me something different, hopefully who's not competing, because they're looking at the data to try and understand which locations am I doing the best in and then I want to try and replicate those factors in more places so I can drive success across the board. Sure. Yeah. A couple more topics here is um, in terms of doing good or staying away from, I guess you have a, a, a specific opinion yourself, I think, Kohl's. Um, and I don't know where your views are now. Uh, yeah, I didn't see the data, the actual uh, your research there, but um, what's your thoughts on, on that? I know potentially turn around, maybe not. <laughs> I, I, look, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite opinions because it gets it gets everyone very annoyed. <laughs> I think we underestimate. This isn't brands. a recommendation, by the way. No, no, absolutely no. not. But I think we underestimate certain brands and certain retailers because we compare them to their height and we don't compare them to reality, right? So right. when we look at someone like, take Macy's, right? Macy's is now kind of more of a darling and we're all excited about Macy's. A year and a half ago, we were, crazy, everyone right? was down on Macy's, right? But we were telling at the time, like, one, their ideas all make sense. Everything they're launching fits. And, you know, it takes time until these things work. And they have this massive base, huge brand awareness. We think that they have a much better chance of recovering than most people are giving them credit for. I think the same logic applies to Kohl's. Kohl's have the Sephora partnership. They have this Discover at Kohl's move, which are both aims to reach a different audience and a really important audience, leveraging their suburban kind of reach and their suburban locations to kind of drive them up and to do something more interesting and widen their, widen their kind of visit share. And they were also, they were a brand that was doing really well pre-pandemic. So if you looked at June through February, so June 2019 through February 2020, every month in that period, visits were up year over year. And so then the pandemic hit and hit them really hard. And I think uh, brands aimed at the middle, saw their margins squeezed, and value was a key part of their what they brought to the, to the table. And so that's going to get hit. And then, you know, people are shifting off price to go even cheaper and trading down hurts them. And then there's issues with supply chain. So I think it was an especially difficult environment for these brands. So we're not really judging them in the right space. And they have, I mean, look, ask any retailer that is rising right now, they're all really excited about how hard it is to reach the level of awareness that Kohl's has, the level True. of scale that they have. So I feel much better about a turnaround there than I think most just trying to be cognizant of, a, of the fact that there is really strong decision making happening. They sit in a space that I feel good about, that middle lane where there's huge competition in value and luxury, but the middle is pretty open if you can do it properly. And they seem to be taking the steps necessary to nail that audience properly. And then add to that all of these built-in strengths and the fact that they were strong pre-pandemic, I think we're getting a little too quick to call their demise. Got it. No, cool. I appreciate the uh, <laughs> the insights there. Now, you, you mentioned off-price, and then I'll go to fitness, and those will be the last two here. Um, off-price, what are you seeing there? Because obviously, this feels like an environment where off-price would take a material step up, and we've kind of been in, I think, this uh, plateau-ish type of uh, environment for there. I think possibly one, and correct me if I'm wrong, where you know the TJ 
uh, Maxis of the world and that whole umbrella of, of companies really leaned in in home goods in terms of their uh, kind of living and, and home department, which thrived for about a year. So you're, you're, you're basically thrive for a while, but it obviously accelerated with COVID and everyone redoing their homes. Um, and maybe that taking a step back. So, you know, you look at comp numbers or comparable sales for that business and, you know, they're plateau-ish um, as opposed to in an environment where you think inflation uh, forces people to trade down, which in some ways they are. Talk about the, the the space. You know, there's there's a couple of players in that space. So I think there's there's two things that are happening. One, we we view economic headwinds as a single whole, but inflation and and gas prices had had different impacts. Gas sure. prices says don't leave your house as often, whereas inflation says how how do you maximize your dollars, right? So if hundred dollars used to buy me X now buys me a little bit less, do I trade down or do I say all right I'll just stomach the cost I really like this retailer? So I think those are different elements. And so the inflation clearly benefits offerers, but I think gas prices hurts everybody across the board. So I think that impact is important. The comparison we're making to an especially strong period because this economic uncertainty still existed last year and you had this kind of pent up demand and this rush back in and off price clobbered. So I think the comparison is really tough. And I think like you said with home goods, there was this surge for home furnishings and home goods was one of the biggest beneficiaries and that leveled off. But I think, I, by the way, I think that is more impacted by the economic headwinds than any real leveling off of demand because people moved. And they moved in pretty significant numbers. It's not like, again, it's not the entire population, but it's more than normal. Sure. It's not differently about their homes. So I think that's going to tick back up in a really significant way. And it's one of the groups we looked at when we were trying to, oh, here's this really interesting kind of potential inflection point. And so I think those off prices are going to be prime beneficiaries. It might not happen next month. Sure. But I think if you felt good about them a year ago, nothing has happened in the last year that makes you feel substantially different about what their long-term prospects are. Got it. No, I think that's a good uh, summary. Last is fitness. You know, we, we spoke with Lifetime Fitness recently. They're popping up everywhere now um, and really trying to take up a lot of space in these malls and like pretty uh, quality malls. Um, they go after a certain demographic. Um, there's one here locally that I see, and that's actually what prompted us. that They're, they're building a bunch here around our, uh, within, you know, an hour away. Um, I think there's like two or three going up. Um, and, you know, whether it's Lifetime or Planet or some others, um, what are you seeing in that space, generally speaking? Uh, then I'll maybe add some stuff, some color, some context. Yeah, yeah. I, I think when we look at the fitness space, I think they're the the glowing example of of what we need to be careful of in a periods of such intense volatility. So I think let's flash back to June 2020. <laughs> I know where Hello, you're going. Peloton, goodbye, every gym. They're all going to suffer. Why would anyone want to be around sweaty people anymore? And then here we are two years later, and it's it's almost like the narrative has been flipped completely on its head. We need to remember this one because. Yes, gyms are gyms are great. Planet Fitness is great. Lifetime is great. And all, you know, Blink Fitness is fantastic. And I think fitness chains that have a really clear sense of who they are are the ones I feel really good about. Especially as we see this growing kind of tendency to like a la carte fitness. So I want my Peloton at home. I want my ten dollars fitness option, and I want Soul Cycle. I want Lifetime, which checks all the boxes. Um, but I, I I feel really good about the fitness space. But it's really important to note here that my how good I feel about the fitness space in terms of brick and mortar doesn't change how excited I would be about connected fitness and at home fitness. These things are complementary. It's not like one wins and the other one must, in theory, you know, one by by necessity struggle. They're both strong entities. And I think we just need to be careful to not over exaggerate something that is clearly so defined by short term pressures. Sure. Yeah. I think we learned that somewhat with Best Buy. I think we learned it maybe again with, um, maybe that, was, that was a troubling period for a lot of those retailers, but I think we learned something there. And then Macy's, I think as well, I think everyone has the JC Penny in their back of their brains um, and extrapolates that out for everybody. And then again here, yeah, you saw the, uh, what a transition that was from uh, Peloton everything to, um, to I mean, what's going on at Peloton is, is short of uh, amazing. Um, cool. You know what? Let's end there. A lot of information. Uh, I told everybody yet, you are the man with the data uh, and the insights. So appreciate you coming on. And, you know, for one second, obviously you've been on a couple of times, but just uh, where to learn more about Placer, uh, what you guys are doing, and then I'll send you off. <laughs> awesome. Sean, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, if, if anyone who's interested, so Placer.ai is our website. We have a free version of our premium product that you can sign up for there at Placer.ai. There's a sign up free button, top right corner, check out our free version. And we also have free tools available in a section of our website called The Square. So you can also check that out. And uh, yeah, it's Sean, always a pleasure talking and have a great rest of the day. Cool.